Hello everyone, my name is Kendra Parzin and I am the moderator for this panel. I would like to kick off our session by introducing you to the National Trust's initiative documenting Chesapeake watershed sites and landscapes important to African Americans, or the Chesapeake Mapping Initiative. The Chesapeake Mapping Initiative is part of the work of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. So the Chesapeake Mapping Initiative is a multi-year phased initiative that is intended to ensure that places important to African Americans are better represented in historic preservation and land conservation priorities in the Chesapeake Bay region, and ultimately that more of these places are recognized and protected. It will also lay the groundwork for future mapping efforts for African American historic places by assessing the effectiveness of different project approaches to identify best practices and by engaging directly with communities to establish collaborative relationships for ongoing work. A direct result of the initiative will be to upload data on the places identified to state level cultural resource information systems, GIS based databases for collecting information on historic resources that are managed by state historic preservation offices. Mapping makes it possible to update conservation priorities and collaborate with landowners and communities on protection and preservation efforts. Mapping data can also be used by infrastructure project developers to identify historic resources during early project development phases so that negative impacts to the sites can be avoided and minimized. It can also generate information that could be the basis for new or expanded interpretive initiatives. Phase one big mapping initiative has been ongoing since 2020. Phase one includes distinct pilot projects that are currently underway in Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. The pilot, the pilot projects were designed to respond to the survey priorities of each state, and each project was also designed to include community outreach and consultation as part of the scope of work. Broadly, the three pilot projects are in Virginia, survey and documentation of sites associated with African American watermen, in Maryland, a review of existing records to identify inf missing information pertaining to African American history in documented historic sites in Calvert, Kent, and Somerset counties. And in Pennsylvania, a crowdsourcing based effort covering nine South Central counties, which is a complement to the Pennsylvania State Historic Preservation Office's baseline survey effort 2020 to 2024, which kicked off in 2020 with a particular focus on identifying African American churches and cemeteries. During the remainder of the session, we will hear about each of these pilot projects in more detail from some of the consultants who are engaged in this work. I would like to acknowledge uh, the National Trust many partners and funders to this work, including the National Park Service Chest Bay Office, the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, the Maryland Historical Trust, the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission, the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership. Finally, I'm also glad to share that the National Trust is currently playing for a phase two of the Chesapeake Mapping Initiative that will build on techniques developed during the phase one Pennsylvania pilot and expand crowdsourcing to other areas of the watershed. Work on phase two is anticipated to kick off later in 2022. So now that we have a little introduction to this work, I am pleased to turn the presentation over to Kayla Halberg to tell us more about work that is ongoing in Virginia. Um, hello everyone, my name is Kayla Halberg. I'm a project manager with Commonwealth Preservation Group based in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, we are um, one firm of, of many firms that are working on an initiative to document sites associated with African-American watermen um, in Virginia's Chesapeake Bay. So just to give a, a start with a broad overview of our project, um, we, our scope of work includes um, public engagement, and we'll dive a little bit more into that uh, next, um, survey of approximately 100 resources um, spread out over three broad regions of the Virginia Chesapeake Bay area, um, development of a multiple property document, one national register nomination, um, as well as recommendations for future work. Um, so as I mentioned, our team um, is large and in part because this is a, is a large project with um, 
many components and um, over a large geographic area. So our, our group is collaborative group of historians and scholars, historic preservationists, community planners um, from two different um, historic preservation consulting firms and cultural resource management firms, um, as well as an independent scholar um, and uh, African-American history scholar. And the primary firm is Commonwealth Preservation Group, where I work. Um, and in addition to overall project management, we worked on survey research and outreach um, in preparation of the NPD and the National Register nomination. Uh, we split the survey and field work with um, our k and and their team. Um, and we also worked with Jeffrey Free Harris, an independent historian um, who's local in Hampton Roads, Virginia, uh, to do outreach and research for our project. Um, so public engagement was a really critical component of our project design um, from the get-go, and we kicked off uh, our, our virtual with a virtual public meeting in September um, of 2021. This wasn't necessarily what we'd hoped for. Um, of course, as everyone is aware, COVID-19 had significant impacts on our public engagement strategy and our plans for that. Um, we had hoped to do several um, history days where we would go out into the community and be able to bring people um, in and do broad public outreach that way. Um, but instead, we um, went with a virtual uh, public engagement route. We did one public meeting in September, as I mentioned, and then we also provided an online comment form through uh, the Virginia Department of Historic Resources website. And they also managed a website with information where um, folks could get additional information on the project and fill out this form. Um, we received approximately 15 responses from our form. Um, and from this, we developed a list, a multi-tabbed spreadsheet um, of organizations, individuals, um, used our existing connections as well as folks who answered the comment form um, to create a list uh, for, for outreach. Um, and from there, we essentially uh, cold called <laughs> as many people as we could. Um, we emailed, uh, Facebook messaged, um, and otherwise contacted people, talked to folks on the street. Um, and I would say we reached out to at least 75 individuals or organizations and quite possibly more um, over the course of several months. Um, and these contacts informed our survey site selection as well as our research for the NPD. Uh, sometimes our public engagement was done in the field. Um, as you all know, sometimes when you're out in the field, folks are asking questions about what you're working on. And often as a part of the survey, we were having to get a lot closer to resources than we typically do. Um, so that put us into close contact with property owners um, with employees of businesses, um, and we were able to engage with people that way and meet additional contacts. Sometimes that also resulted in us getting addresses or um, being shown, oh, we pull out our tablet and they point out on a map um, another place we should go check out and talk to us about why we should go there. Local historical organizations were also instrumental in helping us identify survey sites. Um, the Eastern Shore Waterman's Museum, for example, sent us KML files that we were able to upload into Google Earth um, and add those sites to our survey list. So we had actual pins we could use. Um, that was a rare occurrence. <laughs> Oftentimes we were getting addresses or sort of, well, along this creek, there was a place where we would um, uh, uh, load off our haul and so we were often hand drawing maps um, and sending those back to our contacts. And is this the point? Um, so we were really doing this sort of in a mix of different ways, using um, technology when we could, but also sort of meeting people where they were um, so that we could get the best information possible. So our survey, as I mentioned, focused on three specific regions of the Ch Virginia Chesapeake Bay, and those included the Eastern Shore of Virginia, the Middle Peninsula, and the Northern Neck, and totaled 
11 counties. Um, we did not do specific survey work in the Hampton Roads area, but we do um, have a list of sites for future work that uh, we think will be important um, for adding to, to this project later. Um, all in all, we visited 103 properties, um, but we, re we recorded and documented in the Virginia Cultural Resource Information System 84 resources. The gap um, there was largely due to loss of integrity um, and, and in many cases, demolition of historic resources. Um, in other cases, we, we went out to sites that had been mentioned to us, but ultimately we weren't able to um, document an association with African-American watermen. So we decided not to include those in our, um, our final set of, of survey deliverables. We um, uncovered a range of different types of resources from marine vessels, um, marinas, boat landings, docks, wharfs, uh, marine railways, seafood processing facilities like oyster houses and oyster shucking facilities, um, as you can see uh, sort of centrally located here. Um, that was a resource type that we weren't expecting to uncover, um, but now is quite identifiable to our survey uh, team here. Uh, we also surveyed uh, community resources like churches, schools, social organizations, and small businesses, residential resources, the homes of prominent African-American watermen, as well as historic districts. Um, so the multiple, multiple property document, um, the purpose of, of preparing the NPD as part of this project um, is to really nominate a group of related significant properties. Um, and an MPD in, in content covers shared themes um, and organizes that history into historic context. The MPD also defines property types and designation requirements for resources that represent the historic context. Um, the multiple do property document is a cover document that can be used to streamline individual nominations for thematically related resources. So this, this will serve as an opportunity to help um, resources that might not necessarily individually meet criteria or might have a harder time getting listed individually in the National Register of Historic Places, um, an opportunity to tie itself to this historic context um, and seek designation um, and listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, the MPD that we've developed, we have it, we're in draft stages at this point, um, but it is inclusive of the, of the entire Bay Area um, of Virginia and from the Eastern Shore all the way um, to the Western Fall Lines. The topics include contributions of, of Black watermen and water women to the seafood industry, um, and the context covers colonial period to the late 20th century. Um, other topics include the industrialization of the seafood industry, as well as the socioeconomic impacts um, to black communities throughout the area. Um, and as I mentioned, the goal for the MPD is to create a path for listing property types um, that might not otherwise meet the criteria for listing, or that have a lesser degree of integrity, but are strongly tied to the historic um, context. This approach, we think, is replicable for those wishing to identify, recognize, and list other resource types associated with underrepresented communities. Uh, when we spoke to many local residents, local historians, and other um, watermen who are still working today, often they would start off by telling us about individual um, black watermen. They would mention the name of a person that they knew, someone who taught them the jobs and skills that they use today, and reflected on accomplishments of that individual. These reflections became a section, and probably my favorite section of the NPD, um, dedicated to recognizing the accomplishments and the contributions of individual African-American watermen. These individuals were notable figures in their community. They captained vessels, they built boats, they operated large and small businesses, and pass down their skills from one generation to the next. Some of these men have been documented in local histories um, or by local historians, but most have not. For this reason, public engagement is really critical and these communities still largely communicate via word of mouth. So getting in the community, building trust, 
um, and and one um, one person at a time and in person is still really critical. Something that we've learned um, is that this takes time, um, but it's really worth it. Um, and some of these men, we were actually some of the men pictured here, we were actually able to uh, talk with in person or over the phone, and that that really contributed greatly to the, to our overall project. Um, and really, this list of folks who will be in, in the MPD and who are pictured here is just a start. Uh, we know there are others, and um, we hope that the project will continue to identify these notable water men and women um, in the Chesapeake deserving of recognition and research. So some of our challenges um, for this project, we consistently heard from folks that we were 10 years too late. Um, and what this meant is that we uh, have either lost those significant black watermen to time, or we've lost those resources that have been demolished. Um, redevelopment along the coast is, is rampant. Um, and also we're losing some of these resources to natural disasters and sea level rise. Um, so we were consistently hearing that, which we, you know makes it even more important that we continue this work to document these sites. Um, confirming again the site's association with African-American watermen was difficult. Um, these stories are not necessarily documented in the written record anywhere. And so, again, public engagement um, was really the way, for the most part, that we were able to confirm association with um, Black Waterman communities. Again, COVID-19 limited our in-person outreach and our opportunities for um, conducting oral history interviews. And research institutions, many of them, these small local organizations were either closed um, due to COVID, due to limited staffing, um, and many of them were also closed due to seasonal operations. So we were doing a lot of our research during the winter months, um, and many of these places are open seasonally um, for tourists. Um, so that, that was an interesting obstacle we weren't expecting. Um, many of these areas also have limited access to internet, um, especially in more remote areas of the Eastern Shore and, and the Northern Neck. Um, and that made, we, we kind of went into that knowing that that was going to make engagement through virtual platforms more difficult. Um, short project completion period, which is often the case when it comes to grant projects. Um, we, we now have an extension, which is, was critical for our project. Um, but as you'll see in my recommendations, um, when we're doing projects like this that require such extensive public outreach, I would really recommend um, planning for two to three years for these types of projects. Um, and then for our National Register nomination, we are still working on getting owner permission. And that's something that we think um, is partly tied to education about the National Register and what it means and what it doesn't mean. Um, and also, uh, the rate of vacancy um, or uh, heirs property um, and so just finding who uh, we need to contact to get owner permission has been difficult for um, individual listing. So my other recommendations, um, planning for a variety of engagement approaches, uh, again meeting people where they are, whether that be virtual, in person, on the phone, local events, um, and then being prepared for impromptu oral history on the street. <laughs> and if anybody has uh, any questions, or even if you have tips, if you know African-American watermen from the Chesapeake Bay area, um, or if you have information that would help this project, we would um, love to hear from you. Hello, my name is Ruth Shogate. I am a retired librarian from Washington College. I am now an independent researcher here in Kent County, and I've had the privilege of working on the uh, Kent County uh, project on mapping the Chesapeake um, African American history. Um, this is really a pleasure, and I have so far I have um, enjoyed looking at these architectural. Um, and archaeological sites through the lens of uh, African American history, and it's quite enlightening. So, in this session, I will focus on connecting um, 
with minority communities to document their history. But before that, I will briefly, de briefly describe the Maryland Historic Trust mapping initiative objective and outcome as context for outreach activities in Kent County. Um, then I will follow up with a more detailed description of community outreach and involvement. But let me begin with um, first with the map. So in uh, Kent County, as you can see it's um, right across the bay from Baltimore somewhat, and it's located on the eastern shore of Maryland. It is uh, the smallest county. Um, uh, was incorporated in 1675. Uh, the population, the 2020 population stood at 19,192. And I mentioned that simply because the um, population rate has gone down in Penn County um, and more dramatically so the African American uh, population. Um, this is significant over the years as we see the movement of African Americans out of the county um, and what that, the, the effect that has had on their, their history and in particular, particularly their property ownership. So, like that. Um, so over the decades, they have de declined about 9%. Geographically and economically, Kent County has always been known for its agricultural and maritime landscape and resources since the early 1600s. Uh, this landscape is the historical and cultural backdrop of the lived experiences of African Americans in Kent County. So we see that the mapping of African American history in Kent County is uh, intimately bound to their original um, arrival here in Penn County, starting with their um, arrival as enslaved persons in the mid-60s. While the region's vast open lands and resources inspired the pursuit of religious, economic, and political freedom, on the other hand, the circumstances led to the rise of enslavement. Uh, Kent County was no exception to the effects of slavery. And evidently, as we can see, Kent County is a micro-representation of this historical phenomenon that set the stage for the epic story of an enslaved people. And I put that in there as backdrop because as I went through the documents, so much of the historic places were tied to slavery. And when it comes to community outreach, um, we get a lot of feedback from individuals that, you know, we're tired of talking about slavery and we just don't want to talk about it anymore. But the memories and, and the ghosts of slavery is just very much alive in Kent County. And so that presents to us a part of what our community outreach should be and the perspective, perhaps, um, that we should approach this topic. So um, we see this story of these uh, uh, enslaved people. We still see the juxtaposition of of blacks and whites. And so in looking at um, the labor and economic prosperity of one group and the slow growth of the other, and we look at their sites, uh, buildings, homes, um, and, and look at that as a cultural and historical um, artifacts and manifestation of our history. I think it becomes quite evident, and I was um, quite enlightened um, by looking at uh, the, the documents in the Maryland Inventory of Historic Places. And whereas, though, the slave experience remains a painful topic among Blacks, and they would rather not talk about slavery, um, there is, in addition to that aspect of life, 
there's also a story of resilience, individual and collective strength, and faith. And it is from this perspective that most of the researchers in Kent County now approach um, how we study buildings, life, and cultural uh, significant uh, events and um, geographic places. It is less traumatic. Uh, people are more open to conversation, and they are more willing to tell their stories within that light. Um, they become quite engaged. Uh, the, the, the personal stories of overcoming, achieving ownership, building a community of freed persons provide a good segue to bring in community involvement. So um, the work that has been done in Kent County, particularly by other organizations, have now used that approach and found it quite effective. And I'll talk more about that. Um, and so that's sort of the, the, where the epic story of, of Blacks in Kent County moves towards that more positive outlook. Um, in the historic buildings and properties and structures, including, uh, say, skipjacks are clear evidences of the cultural life of the community. Finding African Americans in these spaces was the main objective of the Maryland Historic Trust, the Kent County project. Our project um, for Kent County, Mapping American History, brings to light African American history with the intention of rooting out and making visible the life experiences of blacks. Uh, from the early days, uh, and some much of which was masked in its historical events and achievements of prominent landowners and their families. So whereas we are now reaching out to African Americans to make that connection, from a research perspective, one still goes back into most of the writings and historical documentation of privileged landowners and families uh, and take it from there to find out, to get the other side of the story. But before reaching out to the community, uh, the Maryland Historic Trust Project required an analysis of the approximately 700 entries in the Maryland Inventory of Historic Places in Kent County. The goal of the Maryland Historic Trust was to clearly identify the buildings in the inventory that have a connection to African American history and architecture. So using the general concept of content analysis methodology, a simple word search was conduct conducted to verify the occurrence of explicit select terms such as Slaves, slavery, blacks, colored, free, free blacks. To search the 700 documents attached to each entry in the inventory of historic uh, properties. This was quite a tedious task, um, going through these 700 documents, you know. At some point I thought, I'm, I can do this in two weeks. Well. That, that, that did not work, of course. Uh, it took a lot more time because reading through each document or doing a word search, doing the word search was very helpful because once any of those words showed up, I could go directly to the content and see what the references were, whether it was that um, the landowner in his will had freed his slaves or he had willed them to somebody else or just a simple statement that among his property were 10 or 11 or whatever the number of slaves were. And that says, okay, they were on this plantation. So we're trying to map the sites of where African Americans were lo located. It's important to know um, 
where the plantations were or where the landowner's home was. So we can see the context actually of the lived experiences of African Americans. And so by doing so, the data provided a starting point in the outreach process. The Kent County documents architectural investigation of buildings and properties owned by blacks and places of work and enslavement. So in these documents were listed also a number of um, properties that were owned by blacks where they worked, um, they were employed, or where they lived if they were freed freed um freed blacks of which there were the proportion of freed blacks to enslaved blacks was uh considerably higher so even in the mid mid 1800s um there were a number of freed blacks and they were able to successfully um build very nice homes establish businesses built churches so you could see where they actually began to establish their own uh, community. So Kent County um, was the home of, of, of a significant population of free African Americans. And so in so doing, they were able to tell the other side of that story. When we look here at um, the property descriptions, in going through this list of in the inventory of um, historical properties, we can see there the number of black churches, there were 21 listed. Some of those churches still existed. I was able to visit most of those churches. Um, the last year, during Legacy Day, each year we honor and celebrate some aspect of black history. And last year uh, was black churches, uh, where they listed the churches. There were 25 churches that were over 100 years old, and they were still in existence. So that is um, really good history and, and buildings. And they were in the inventory and very well documented as you can see. Um, for schools and education, they're the early segregated schools, many of which were aff affiliated with the black churches. So pretty much where there were churches, there were schools. And between the schools and the churches, that space also became a community center and a place for, for gathering and, and just socializing. Now, on the enslavement, we identified 46. That means there were like 46 entries that mentioned the slaves, the number of slaves that were on the plantation. However, I would say for further studies, um, it would be actually more than 46 because there were many that were in the 16, 17, 1800s before. Uh, emancipation that did not mention slaves, but it's known that um, they were slave owners. So that could also be a follow-up. African American residences, uh, as I mentioned before, there were uh, free blacks who had established their own homes, built their own homes and, and businesses. But this also includes wherever there was a um, community of blacks. So it would cover uh, tenement, tenement houses, um, space boarding houses, um, and in individual homes, personal homes. So the number 16, that's just, again, from that inventory. So probably most likely that number in reality is larger. Uh, social organizations and um, let's just move to the next. Yeah. 
social organizations and lodges and institutions. Uh, these are really interesting places. Some of them were actually in churches, some were held in residences. Uh, but as I mentioned here, they reflect the more joyous moments of social and cultural life of blacks in Kent County. So they're really worth um, looking into further. And commerce, although the number is uh, low, it says four, many were existed, many more um, places of business existed in the black communities. Uh, such as the village of Morgneck, Olivet Hill, Chesterville Forest, and Millington. So for me, I've lived in Chestertown for over 30 years, and I've had a chance to volunteer in the community. I had the advantage of knowing the local agencies and persons who had done research as also part of that community seeking to construct and sometimes reconstruct the history of African Americans in Kent County. Because the history of blacks is so inextricably bound to the history of whites, those sources enlighten the understanding of life of, black, life of blacks in Kent County. And so the, the agencies that I went to for further information beyond the Maryland Inventory of Historic Places was the Kent County Historical Society. It's a very rich source of uh, documents, uh, stories, articles written by local people. Um, and so I found that very interesting. In fact, when I go there to, to do some work, I would leave with more stories than the actual documents because everybody had a story to tell me. Did you hear about this? Do you know about that? And they just kept bringing out documents after documents. So that's a really um, great place to go. Now, Sumner Hall, which is the Grand Army of the Republic, post number 25, that um, was renovated and is up and running it honors veterans, but it also acts as a cultural center and we also do some research there. So I found that to be very helpful. As uh, a star center for the study of American experience at Washington College, they have done a tremendous amount of work on African American history. The latest project that they have, they're working on is almost completed is a Chesapeake Heartland and it's focused, um, exclusively on African American history. They have a website where um, a number of interviews have been done. You can always go and, and watch the interviews, their videos, or they're also just recordings. Um, they are also working on, uh, I think, the mapping of some of the his African American historic places in Chestertown. So, that's a really good source of information. Um, I also worked with the Washington College History Society. They were particularly interested in Washington College's connection to slavery. So they, they have done some work. It's on their website. Um, and the students, they, they hire, they, assigned much of this research to students to conduct those. So um, again, that was very helpful, not just reading the documents, but being a part of um, building out that, the, the content of that um, website. So that was really good. Um, and there are individuals I found who work really well with um, the research. They're actually out there doing the research themselves. They're like independent, <laughs> one-person resources. So there's also a connection to that. So in conclusion, I would say that there are, there is more work to be done. Um, there are areas that still can be, we need more information. We didn't have any documentation on the 
any stops on the Underground Railroad. Um, there are some more cemeteries we have to do. There was nothing on farming um, and also the crabbing and oyster industry. So um, I will close there. If anybody has more questions, I would be willing and happy to answer. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the National Trust both for inviting me to be a part of this session today as well as to help develop this project over the last few years. And I would like to thank Kendra for arranging this session for us today and, and getting us all in here together. Um, I also appreciate the assistance of our various project partners who have assisted through funding and uh, institutional support. And I want to acknowledge uh, some additional members that were a part of our project team, uh, including Laura Ricketts from Arkoski Engineering and Alma Sulaji and Rebecca Song from uh, WSP. They were a big help on this project for me. For anyone who's not aware, uh, as uh, has um, Kendra told us at the beginning, there are actually two complementary projects underway right now in Pennsylvania. Uh, the first of these is uh, our project, the Crowdsourcing African American Cultural Sites in South Central Pennsylvania project, which is covering Adams, Cumberland, Dauphin, Franklin, Fulton, Lancaster, Lebanon, Perry, and York counties. And this project is focused on a wide array of potential historic sites that includes properties that don't typically arise out of traditional background research. And we're trying to achieve this through the use of crowdsourcing by listening to the community and asking them to help us identify uh, important stories and places that aren't captured in the mainstream historical record. And our project is working in tandem with uh, the Baseline Survey Project, which was begun in 2020 by the Pennsylvania State Historic Preservation Office. And as part of that project, they're conducting a, a statewide baseline survey which focuses in individual counties on identifying properties associated with the African-American experience in Pennsylvania. Um, focused primarily on churches and cemeteries, but also including uh, social uh, organizations and, and uh, uh, other resources such as the, motor, uh, the, the Green Book, um, census data and uh, mapping resources like Sanborn maps to identify uh, African-American historic places in Pennsylvania. The crowdsourcing African American heritage sites in South Pennsylvania, South Central Pennsylvania project has three primary goals. The first of these is that we are trying to engage the African American community in the process of identifying culturally important sites. We want the local community to help to tell us what is important and historically significant rather than the other way around. We also hope that this will just be a first step in an ongoing conversation around these historical places. Our project involves basic survey and identification of the places that are brought to our attention, but we anticipate that with some local support, these places could be further recognized either in their local communities or, uh, or possibly be considered for a National Register listing. We are also using this project to raise awareness of the importance of African American history as a part of Pennsylvania's history. And as we've uh, talked to people in the community, we've learned from so many people uh, that have reached out to us that there are lots of local projects that are focused on the identification of important sites of African American history. And we are hoping through this project to both draw more attention to, the, to these stories and groups, as well as make connections between existing groups. Finally, uh, we're, we're going to collect the geographic and basic recordation information about these properties that have been identified to us, and we're going to make it available for future planning through the, the PA SHPO's PA Share database, which is their cultural resources GIS. To support the project's goals, we set up a project website that was designed and hosted through Squarespace. Um, we used it as a, both a launching point and a clearinghouse for information that we wanted to make sure that we shared with the public throughout the project. The website hosts uh, a link to our mapping service. It provides a location to collect virtual public meeting registrations and served as a forum to disseminate existing information available from project partners like the PA SHPO about their, their projects and programs. Uh, among the resources that we provided through the website were links to blog posts, both at the National Trust about this project and the wider Chesapeake Mapping Initiative. And we also linked to stories and events that seemed like they would be pertinent to the members of the public that we were reaching out to. This included uh, stories from the PA SHPO's blog about um, 
ongoing survey efforts, as well as events that happened during the during the time when we were holding some of our meetings, uh, such as the Pennsylvania Hallowed Grounds uh, annual meeting, uh, which focuses specifically on African American cemeteries. So we made sure that that information was was available uh, and people could find it. The primary tool that we used for our project was a wiki mapping site, uh, a, a screenshot of which you can you can see here and, and you'll see in more detail in some of the following slides. The wiki mapping portal was designed in part with our project partners at WSP. They handled both the initial setup as well as the management of the resources on the map throughout the project for us. And if anyone is interested in seeing the map, uh, I provided the uh, website as part of this slide. You, it, it was still available in its read-only format and should be accessible at the website uh, listed. So these two images provide a bit more detail reflecting the number of points that have been placed on our map. Pink dots on the map consist primarily of known sites in the region that have been previously identified. And though these aren't exhaustive, uh, they were designed to really help people visualize the process and to, to not land on an empty map uh, when we started the project. We didn't want the first few users to, to land on our map and, and not know where to begin. So we wanted to sort of seed, seed the map a little bit. And then all of the orange dots were, were placed by members of the public. As you can see, there are several dense clusters around cities and boroughs like York, Lancaster, and Gettysburg, with a, a, a more scattered collection through the region's rural areas. You may also notice that there are very few resources located in, in some of the rural counties, particularly Fulton, Franklin, and Perry counties. Um, that's definitely something that we noticed through the project that we didn't have as much participation from or identification in these more rural counties. In the second image, you can see the density of a place uh, like York City and the, the number of um, historical points we were able to collect on our map. Um, and you can see the geographic distribution of the points. You know, the concentrations of points clearly denote certain neighborhoods that were African-American. And although you can't see from this level, several points also reflect the history of the community that has been lost um, to forces such as urban redevelopment in the mid 20th century. So I wanted to briefly just discuss some of the things that we've learned so far through this project. Um, as, we, as we engaged with the public, we, we definitely noticed there were a, a few uh, handful of groups that self-selected and, and spoke up early and were, were deeply involved with the project. Um, and from, from this group, we really had a long period of activity. They were in regular contact with us. They were continually adding information to our map um, and, and providing a, a lot of resources and also bringing more people uh, to the project over time. Um, on, the, uh, on the other hand, from, from most users, we, we really noticed there was a lull in activity. Um, from the time that we originally posted the map, we had a, a brief spurt of activity. And then again, at the very end, we had a last minute rush of activity. And even some folks requesting that we keep the map open a little bit longer because uh, they hadn't gotten a chance to add to it yet. Uh, we had the map initially open for uh, for three months, but extended it uh, to a fourth month to make sure that people had the opportunity and the time to, uh, to provide us input through the, the wiki map. So we had a total of 136 entries submitted through the wiki map, and we only had two counties where we didn't have any entries at all. Uh, the highest number of properties that have been identified are in York, Lancaster, and Adams counties, and these properties really cover um, cover the, the breadth of the African-American experience in, uh, in the South Central Pennsylvania region. We certainly have had churches and cemeteries identified on the map. We've had uh, underground railroad stops. We've had um, social institutions, sites of, uh, uh, that were part of the civil rights movement have all been included on our, on our map so far. Uh, the most feedback that we received was really from specific uh, organized local groups, and we didn't get as much feedback from individuals or churches. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge some of the groups that have been have been involved in, and put a lot of uh, effort into making this a project, uh, this project a success for us. Um, a few other things that we learned were that there was some pushback and resistance to duplicating work from some organizations who reached out to us. Um, they'd obviously been doing a lot of work on the ground. I didn't want to duplicate their efforts um, that they put into, into research and identification. 
And we also, uh, similar to as, as, as Kayla mentioned, uh, due to COVID, we, we were doing all of our meetings virtually and we really felt the need for in-person meetings, which was also expressed to, to us in our, in our follow-up meetings uh, as we've been um, winding down the, the data collection portion of the project. The, there are members of the public who um, really would have liked to have met us in person to talk about the project. As of August, the remaining work for the project focuses on recording the properties that have been identified to us and making that data that we received available to the PA SHPO. Uh, we'll be surveying using ESRI products that will allow the information that we collect to be directly entered into the PA SHPO's GIS system. Uh, due to budgetary constraints, if any of the, uh, the, the properties that were identified to us, if we aren't able to survey all of them, uh, we'll be compiling a list uh, that will be provided to the PA SHPO and our other partners for any possible future survey efforts when time or staffing will allow. And after the survey work is complete, our final project reporting will be thinking critically about the success of the overall project and providing recommendations for any improvements that could be made for the future. Um, it, it sounds like uh, we're definitely um, planning to make sure that, that we can provide the, the, the best information possible as, we, as the, the National Trust prepares to go into phase two um, and, and would like to consider this approach for additional projects in the future. Um, so we'll be compiling that information as, as we head into the fall. With that, thank you all for your time and uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any additional questions about the project. I'd be glad to, to answer them. Thank you so, so much, Kayla, Ruth, and Ben for uh, sharing more with us about the, the work that you've been doing. And thank you also for all of that hard work because I know that it's been uh, quite a bit. So we do have a little bit of time now for a brief discussion. Um, and I wanted to kick it off with, with this question. Um, so, so, you know, obviously several of the session are here to speak about documenting the histories of black communities that we are not part of. Uh, I think we can all acknowledge that the historic preservation field has uh, work to do to support the development of a more diverse workforce and also that historic preservation requirements can be quite complex, which is a barrier to public participation at times. Um, at the same time, of course, there is some urgency to identify the, and uplift the stories of underrepresented communities to prevent them from being threatened or lost. And Kayla, I'm particularly thinking of, of you know, what you heard when you were out in the field that I wish you'd, you know, you're 10 years too late. Um, so, as practitioners, how, how can we uh, best navigate the, the need to document historic for their protection um, and also allow underrepresented communities the, some, some space to tell their own stories? Well, I guess I'll go first if nobody else wants to field this one. Um, I think one of the, the biggest things we've been able to do through this project is working with local partners. Um, uh, I know. I, I noticed that Kayla was working with. Uh, is it free? Was this last name Harris? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, free Harris. Work, work, yeah, working working with uh, local partners who, who know the history of a place can be really important. Um, I know the, the folks who reached out to us and were most involved in our project. Um, uh, some of them really helped helped make the connections for us. Um, you know, we had done a lot of outreach at the beginning, but didn't didn't get connected to some of the African American churches through cold calls and emails. Um, but they were able, uh, particular uh, particularly a woman with the uh, Lebanon Cemetery Association, was able to connect us with other other people within the African American community, bring them to public meetings, as well as get us connected with other folks. And so I think those local partners uh, can really make or make or break a, a project. Um, when we're approaching it uh, as as uh, as the white folks in the room. Well, I would I would add um, that there's still a significant amount of trust building. I mean, uh, folks from our office at CPG, we we feel like we're local um, in some ways to many of these communities as well. And Free Harris is local and um, our partners at RK and K are in Northern Virginia. Uh, so closer to some areas than we are. But um, even with that, there's there's still a, an important degree of trust building to do. Um, and we think that that in any project that we work on um, with underrepresented communities or where we know oral history is gonna be necessary, 
um, or when we're just talking about difficult history in general, um, spending the time doing that is really important. Um, and then after we've done that and we've shown up and we've done the work, um, just letting the community, letting the individuals tell their story um, and kind of removing any, as much as we possibly can, right? Any biases that uh, we might bring into a project or assumptions that we might have had before we started um, on an effort to engage with this community. And, and you know, oftentimes when we do oral histories, especially uh, when we're listening back to them uh, here in our office, our, our person, our interviewer is quiet. Uh, we have questions and we come kind of open-minded, but we just let the community tell their story. And a lot of what we've been trying to do with our MPD as well is, you know, we we, we did go into this with assumptions and then recognize those and, and, and restructured the way that we um, talked about the communities and talked about the people and made a people a really an important focus after hearing from uh, from members of the community. Um, so, yeah, I think that just listening and letting communities tell their story the way that um, they want it to be told. Um, from from my perspective of um, of storytelling, or also working with other groups, um, and and basically sometimes they're like, you don't understand, not me, but. It's, it's a racial thing, unfortunately, and they will say, based on experience and, and what you grew up with that, well, you know, white people, do you really understand my story? If I tell you my story, um, can you get it from my perspective? So I think really allowing them to, to tell their story is one thing, um, sharing empathy, the experiences that you have had yourself um, being either on the fringes or the margins can really can really help. It helps to to build trust to say, yes, you probably have some idea of of what I'm talking about. So I believe that um, building trust is it's um, not just listening, but having that conversation where you, where you can also show or explain that yes i understand that because it may it may be a different kind of experience but it's one in which you felt perhaps a little marginalized perhaps your history was not the same as the predominant group you were with and so it begins to show an understanding there of what it is and as, as I mentioned that uh, instead of there being so much focus, because what happened, it was like, oh, slavery and so much about slavery, we shifted that story a little bit because the story of slavery is known. It, it's not a pleasant one and on both sides. And so just being able to shift it a little bit to something that is, yes, this happened. Um, what were the things we went on? What made, what made you happy? What were your happiest moments? And what we actually found out, at least I know, I didn't find out, I know this, is that there is happiness in life regardless. And so they, they really feel that, oh, my mother used to do this or my father, or when we lived in the country, we did this or did that. And, you know, so the story becomes, it, it has it has a different sort of nuance and texture to it and, and it becomes alive. So I think that being able to flip some of those questions into more positive ones and listening and sharing your own experiences will bring them out a lot more. Thank you, Rude. I think that's that's excellent advice. Um, well, thank you all very much for your, your thoughtful answers to that question. We are at an hour, um, so we will wrap up. Uh, thank you again very much for your time and your expertise.
Uh, and thank you to everyone who is taking the time to view this session. We are glad to have been able to share with you. Thanks very much.